So good morning, everybody out there. Thank you for joining this month's, this month's session of the Caveon webinar series. Today, we are very pleased to be joined by Do Dr. Jim Wallach of the University of Wisconsin. John, or I'm sorry, Jim and Caveon's own John Freemer were both co-editors for the recently published Handbook of Test Security. So today, we wanted to share some of the key uh, nuggets from the handbook. So let's move to the next slide, and I'm going to turn things over to Jim Wallach. Jim, what are we going to cover today? Outstanding. So uh, the agenda for today is, is uh, pretty simple here. I'm going to lead things off, uh, just give a general overview of the handbook, uh, talk to you a little bit about you know, why we set out to, to do this and, and what we're hoping to accomplish. Uh, and then John and I are going to walk you through the chapters and just talk a little bit about each of the chapters in that. So uh, I'm going to, you know, start that and, and go through about the first half of the chapters, turn it over to John, uh, and then uh, he'll turn it back over to me at the very end, and uh, I'll sort of give my closing thoughts and some takeaway messages. Hey, uh, and Jim, I, before... I think we'll have time for questions, too. Excellent. Yes, hey, please. I forgot to do a little bit of housekeeping. Everybody, you are muted. We have hundreds of people registered. So to minimize any distraction, everyone is on mute. But you will see in your little uh, control panel, there is a place for you to type in questions. Uh, so please feel free while we're moving along. Depending upon time, we'll stop throughout the presentation for questions, and then we will strive to have time at the end for Q&A. Um, and just a reminder, these slides will be made available on our website, as will an actual recording of Jim and John's presentation. So, sorry, Jim. Not a problem. Uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and move to the next slide, please. All right. So uh, this is an edited volume, as Steve mentioned. Uh, John and I are the two editors. Uh, and then each of the chapters is written by a different set of uh, leading experts in, in test security. Um, if you take a look at the Routledge webpage, um, then you'll see that there's actually a little bit of disagreement over the exact date when this book's going to be out. Uh, some of the uh, pages say the 24th, some say the 25th, others actually say the 27th. So I, I, I wish I could tell you, I really do, uh, what the exact date was. We know it will be available uh, next week, however, and it's already available for advanced purchase. Um, the book focuses largely on uh, preventing, detecting, and investigating cheating, uh, very broadly defined, uh, and then provides insights and recommendations that cut across each of the association of test publishers for testing domains, uh, certification, licensure, clinical, educational, and industrial organizational, and provides uh, examples of uh, you know, actual security violations within each of those domains and, and lessons that have been learned within each of those domains as well. Um, next slide, please. Large-scale testing, uh, large-scale standardized testing especially, is an integral part of our culture. Uh, tests, as you know, are, are used as gatekeeper, gate, gatekeepers for so many professional goals, uh, licensure certification, uh, advancement in school or graduation, admissions uh, to higher education programs, uh, job promotion, I mean, all, all sorts of things. Uh, and as a result of that, the incentive to cheat has never been higher. Uh, and, and it really is a very serious problem. Uh, in fact, it's really hard to you know, read the newspaper or watch the news and, and not hear about cheating on tests. Uh, security issues, unfortunately, are uh, not isolated within any particular realm of cheating, but really cut across all walks of cheating. Um, and uh, if you attend professional conferences like the Association of Test Publishers or uh, National Council on Measurement and Education, National College Testing Association, uh, there's now a, a, a conference dedicated entirely to detection of, of potential test fraud, uh, you'll see that, um, that, that test security issues are becoming uh, more and more uh, present at these conferences. In fact, at this most recent 
ATP conference, there were so many sessions on test security that you couldn't actually attend all of them even if you wanted to because they were competing against each other. So the industry recognizes this is a serious problem uh, and is, is starting the process of working together and talking about it and presenting solutions, um, but uh, um, we still have a long ways to go. Uh, a lot of what's known about test security right now uh, resides in testing companies and, and the methods that they're using, the procedures that they're using, it's all proprietary because they're not wanting that information to get into the hands of the wrong people. Uh, and in this book, we're trying to set some of that aside uh, in the interest of um, really advancing the field and, and improving what we know uh, and the status quo where security issues are concerned. So uh, next slide, please. So the purpose here of the handbook really is to advance the science of test security. Uh, and the way that we try to do this is by drawing on insights of uh, psychometricians and policymakers uh, to really provide a comprehensive resource that, that deals with the entirety uh, of test security. Uh, so all genres of testing, all aspects of testing, uh, and, and protecting the security of our program. So, the specific focus is on uh, best practices for designing secure tests, uh, understanding uh, and analyzing one's security vulnerabilities, uh, heavy emphasis on, on prevention and detection strategies, uh, and then also um, a, a strong emphasis on learning uh, from uh, other people's unfortunate situations and, and their violations and their security initiatives uh, so that we're not all stuck recreating our own test security wheels. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the organization of the handbook is as follows. Uh, there are three main parts to the handbook. Uh, the first part focuses in on designing secure delivery systems. So uh, we know that there are certain types of um, security issues that are unique to the way in which the test is delivered. Is it a computer-based test? Is it a, a paper and pencil test? Uh, are we talking about multiple choice tests or are we talking about um, you know, essay tests? Uh, is this a test in a classroom environment, you know, classroom tests? So we know that, that uh, the security issues are, are unique and so we focus on each of the different modalities in, in part one. Uh, and, and these chapters in particular are really focusing on um, uh, prevalence, you know, what, what's going on, how big a problem is it, uh, what are the major threats, uh, and then most importantly, how do we prevent and detect those. In part two of the handbook, we focus in uh, on, on what we've called, for lack of, of something better, important issues in test security. Uh, so there are a whole host of issues that really cut across uh, testing programs. Uh, and, and it doesn't, these are things that, that are important to preserve the integrity of a program regardless of the type of program, regardless of, of the, the uh, testing modality, regardless of the uh, discipline that you're in. Uh, if you're doing testing, these are things that you need to be uh, concerned about. Uh, the focus in these chapters then is on security uh, throughout the entire testing process, before, during, after the exam, uh, and developing a uh, culture of testing security throughout all phases of, of testing organizations and, and throughout all phases of, uh, of testing. Um, and then also uh, a, a heavy focus on what do you do when you actually find yourself in that unfortunate situation where you have a security breach and, and you know, sort of dealing with that, dealing with uh, you know, data forensics, dealing with the legal issues, dealing with the investigative uh, piece. Uh, and then finally, part three, uh, although I, I should mention in, in parts one and two, there are a lot of good examples, uh, you know, that are, that are um, scattered throughout those chapters. Part three is really an in-depth focused look at, at the lessons that have been learned uh, by our colleagues. Uh, and so we have a chapter for each of the four ATP disciplines that focus on the security issues uh, that they've experienced within their, um, you know, within their own programs. Uh, Steve, I, I think maybe we have a poll coming up. Is that right? That's correct. So we like to uh, we like to learn a little bit about the audience. So the the first poll is: Were you aware of the Handbook of Test Security before receiving notifications of this webinar? So we'll take just a moment and uh, and let people respond. 
<clears throat> Looks like we've got about, well, most of you responding pretty quickly. So I'll close the poll in just a couple more seconds. We've got about 85% of the people have responded, and now let's share those results. Interesting, Jim, about 40% hadn't heard of it, 30% are eagerly awaiting its publication, 30%, 29% uh, were, had, had an idea about it. Well, Close this up I'm and glad you so many going. Yeah, I'm glad then that so many people uh, you know, have found out about it here and, and have availed themselves of this opportunity to learn a little bit more about, about this book. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and move on. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, oh, I've got my slide set uh, out of order here. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, actually, let's move past this slide. I'm sorry. Let's go on to the next slide. Oh, you know what? Sorry, I've got, there we go. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. I had the wrong thing that popped open uh, on my computer, Little computer issues on my end. Uh, okay, so what I would like to do now is uh, just start the process of walking people through the different chapters uh, that we have and, and just talk real briefly about what the chapter's focus is, what are some of the, the you know exciting things that are covered in this chapter. Uh, this first chapter uh, on the test security threat is, is really intended to sort of set the stage for uh, all the chapters that follow it. Uh, the purpose here in this chapter is just to say, look, cheating's going on. Uh, it's pervasive. Uh, no one is immune from from uh, test security threats. If you um, haven't found cheating going on in your program, or you think it's not happening in your program, it's just because uh, you're not looking hard enough. You don't know how to look, where to look, uh, because uh, you know unless you're talking about a test with absolutely no stakes, uh, and, and even then you might have it, it too. But certainly anything with any stakes, there's going to be some cheating, uh, and there are significant costs to this, um, both monetary costs and and also uh, you know the reputations of of the testing industry and the discipline. Uh, are really at stake here. Um, so it reflects very poorly on, on all of us when there are security violations. The, uh, you know, all of this talk about security would probably um, not be such a big deal if it were really easy to catch this. You know, if every time someone was cheating, we identified it and we could deal with it. The problem is that it's very hard to catch. Uh, and so, um, you know, the, the point here is we, we really need to be vigilant and we need to be uh, improving our methodologies and our approaches uh, to prevent it, but also to catch it after the fact if, if someone does happen to sneak through. Uh, next slide, please. The first chapter in part one uh, on designing secure delivery systems it focuses in on large scale paper and pencil testing. Uh, and this chapter really focuses on, on K-12 accountability testing and national admissions testing, uh, not because those are the only uh, paper and pencil programs um, out there, uh, and not because the stuff that they talk about doesn't pertain to other types of programs, but because those really are the major um, programs in uh, standardized you know, paper and pencil testing. Uh, so, so it's all sort of contextualized within a K-12 and national admissions testing um, setting. Uh, this chapter focuses on uh, the variety of methods by which people cheat and, and examples of these, you know, before the test, during the test, after the test. So focusing on things like cheating by examinees and administrators, uh, test tampering, for example. Um, the, the problems associated with exposure or disclosure of test materials, uh, inappropriate test preparation, uh, and, and how we draw the line between uh, proper and improper uh, test preparation, um, inappropriate test administration. Uh, you know, all of those are covered in, in depth in this chapter, uh, and with a particular emphasis on prevention and detection uh, of, of uh, these security vulnerabilities and, and uh, fraud when it's actually happening. Uh, the chapter ends with a set of recommendations uh, for testing program managers 
uh, so as to help them improve the integrity of their uh, of their testing program. Next slide, please. The next chapter focuses on security issues in technology-based testing, and, and technology-based testing uh, is um, you know all of the new types of testing. So it's not only uh, computer-based testing and CAT, but moves into online testing, uh, internet-based testing, those those types of things. And and we know that uh, technology has created all sorts of new ways to deliver tests, but as a result has also created uh, a host of uh, security vulnerabilities, new vulnerabilities. Uh, and this chapter goes through them and talks about the, the issues with on-demand testing, uh, when students test whenever they want, uh, internet-based testing, where you just can't see, you know, you don't, uh, you're, you're not bringing people into a proctored site. Um, the fact that any sort of technology-based test has electronic distribution of test files, um, and so these files are out there and they're vulnerable uh, to being captured. Uh, storage of item banks, test files, results files, uh, personally identifiable you know, examinee information is, is all stored electronically. Um, continuous testing windows introduce problems uh, or potential problems with question overexposure. Uh, the fact that there are remote testing centers all over the world that, that aren't necessarily standardized in terms of administrative conditions uh, presents a host of, of security issues. And so they go through these in, in, uh, in you know, a lot of depth. Uh, it talks about the difference between theft and cheating, uh, and again, really focusing in on prevention strategies, deterrent strategies, and, and detection strategies for all of the different types of security violations that, uh, that, that could occur in a technology-based environment. Next slide, please. The, uh, the next chapter focuses in on classroom testing, which we know is, is overwhelmingly paper-based. Um, but what's really uh, exciting about this chapter is that it's really not very redundant with the first chapter, which focused in on uh, large-scale paper and pencil testing. Uh, and, and we know that some of the types of cheating uh, and the, the security violations or security vulnerabilities are the same, but there are many that are uh, that are different in classroom testing. Uh, we know in a classroom environment, uh, the teachers usually know the students sometimes quite well, uh, which of course reduces things like proxy testing. Uh, we also know, however, that the students know each other often very well. Uh, which has its own vulnerability uh, issues and people knowing who to cheat with and, and they're in contact a lot outside the testing environment. Uh, the physical security vulnerabilities are much greater in a classroom environment. The rooms aren't designed for testing. Students already know the layout of everything. Uh, they often have unsupervised access to rooms in advance. Uh, so many physical security issues. Uh, this chapter deals with all of these uh, vulnerabilities as they relate to classroom testing, uh, particularly focusing on deterring and uh, cheating and mitigating motivations to cheat. I, I think uh, there's a realization that classroom teachers and, and faculty aren't too likely to be running a data forensics program uh, to identify cheating, probably don't have those, you know, access to anything like that even on their campus. Uh, so the real focus is on, is on deterrence. Uh, and prevention, and, and there are some really good practical um, tools that, that teachers can use to um, uh, you know, prevent and deter cheating and reduce students' motivation to cheat. Next slide, please. Uh, the final chapter in this uh, part of the handbook deals with security issues in writing assessment, uh, and this is very exciting because there really is not much uh, that's written and available uh, that that explains about security issues in writing assessment. Uh, again, a lot of this information, uh, to the extent that it does exist, is is information that resides in testing, in test publishers and testing organizations. Uh, this chapter lays out the issues with writing assessment, both in a large scale and a classroom context. Uh, focuses in on the security vulnerabilities, uh, particularly with respect to uh, the the possibility of of prompts being compromised. Um, and, and also the possibility that responses could be fraudulent, they could be, uh, um, you know, cut and pasted from other sources or, or um, you know, it could be an essay from a, an essay warehouse or, or something like that. 
the, the primary focus uh, here is on um, plagiarism and, and issues around automated scoring uh, of essays. So with plagiarism, uh, the, the chapter lays out all the different de detection systems, uh, what's involved in those, you know, how they actually work, uh, and then focuses a lot also on prevention of plagiarism. Um, and then uh, also talks about this automated essay scoring and the vulnerability there, of course, is that uh, students can game the system. And so what approaches maybe uh, make it less likely for students to be able to game or make it easier to detect it when it actually uh, is going on. Um, next slide, please. And do we have a do we have a question here or what's the next slide? I'm not quite sure what this is. Yeah. So this this is just a placeholder. Ah, where, gotcha. Uh, <laughs> any questions at this point, Jim? So um, you know, Jim, one that arose is: Do you know will there be a Kindle or Nook version of the handbook? That is an excellent question. Uh, unfortunately, it's one I don't have an answer to. Um, okay. uh, I, you know, I don't know if you have some mechanism on your website to, uh, you know, I mean, we can certainly inquire with the publisher, and uh, but I just don't know how to get that information back out to people. Great. Um, so we've got some other questions, but let's move on because I know that some of these are covered. Um, later on. Okay, terrific. Um, so we're going to move now into the second part of the book, Important Issues in, in Test Security. Uh, we're going to take the chapters a little bit out of, out of order, but I think it makes uh, for, um, uh, for perhaps a more coherent presentation here. Uh, so the first chapter that I want to talk about is a chapter on physical security uh, at test centers and, and at the testing company. Um, this chapter goes into a, a, all sorts of detail on, on how to control the physical testing environment to protect the data. So protecting test content, intellectual property, uh, examinee's personal identification data, you know, all, all of that. Um, they focus on uh, issues of, of testing environment layout, um, which uh, again sort of broadly defined to also include, you know, layout of uh, you know, the environments in which test materials are stored and, and dealing with access issues for testing and non-testing personnel. Uh, the check-in process for, for uh, test takers and, and examining authentication, uh, proctoring guidelines and, and um, you know, proctor training uh, is, is covered in this chapter to a, a certain extent. Uh, handling of test materials. Um, so, you know, here, not just talking about the final copy of tests, but, you know, items and materials in different phases. So, again, a lot of access issues, um, uh, firewalls, encryption, how to work with outside um, contractors, like, like the folks who do printing or shipping of exams. Um, and then security audits also um, are covered here in this chapter. Uh, next slide, please. The, uh, the next chapter I'm going to talk about is on educator cheating and the statistical detection of group-based uh, test security threats. Uh, and you know this, there's a special place in my heart for, uh, uh, for the chapter here on statistical detection as that's sort of my primary uh, research area. Uh, this particular chapter is, uh, I think, very, very exciting because of its, of its focus on uh, group-based threats. So there's a fair bit in the literature on um, you know, detection of individuals who are involved in, in cheating, but there's very, very little uh, that deals with what we regard as the, the bigger problem uh, of how to, uh, how to detect, identify sort of organized rings, uh, whether we're talking about, um, you know, illegal test preparation or internet-based discussion groups, uh, exam wholesalers, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, maybe it's test tampering, organized proxy testing. I mean, those are uh, what we, what the industry generally regards as the most serious um, vulnerabilities and the most serious uh, problems when they occur. And so, uh, the focus here is really on on detecting uh, that sort of stuff. Um, uh, the chapter uh, does have some math and some equations, but uh, it is about as non-technical a description as, as I've seen. 
Uh, it does a very good job making uh, accessible uh, you know, the science behind the data forensics uh, approaches. Um, and so talks a lot about similarity and copying analyses, erasure analysis, gain score analysis, person fit, uh, use of response latency, all of those sorts of things. Uh, discusses the credibility of various sources of data uh, as well for detecting different types of, uh, of possible cheating. Uh, and then uh, also I think uh, a really interesting aspect of this chapter is that it, it is a discussion on the standards for statistical evidence of, of test security breaches. So uh, what's required for evidence to be admissible in court, uh, advice on managing one's false positive rate, especially if you're you know, using this as for data mining, uh, thoughts on um, using multiple indexes in combination, a lot of the things that, that we know are going on uh, but maybe are being done in a haphazard way, uh, this chapter uh, sort of approaches them in a very scientific manner. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, the, the last chapter that I'm going to talk about before turning things over to John is, is the chapter on legal matters in test security. Uh, and, and similar to the chapter uh, that we saw on writing assessment, uh, this is an area in, within test security that's just critically important uh, and there is absolutely nothing out there uh, that's written um, and so you know this chapter alone actually is probably reason enough to, to get a copy of this book. Uh, th this chapter focuses in on, on the case law related to um, score cancellation and the basics of, of US copyright law. Uh, so um, you know what what's sorts of cases have happened, have, have, um, you know, what cases have there been where the courts have decided when is it appropriate to cancel scores, when is it not appropriate to cancel scores. Um, uh, they, they focus in particular on the legal issues uh, at the three different phases, before an exam, during the exam, or after the exam. Uh, so before the exam, they, they talk a lot about the role of candidate agreement forms. Uh, and organizations having, uh, you know, clear and well-defined security policies. Um, during the exam, uh, there are legal issues there with biometric data and limits to how biometric data can be used, um, as well as proctor intervention. When should proctors be uh, be intervening when they observe things? When should they be letting uh, letting the testing go on? Uh, and then after the exam as well, uh, and the fact that there's really, uh, the courts have, have indicated there's no need to prove cheating. Um, the, the role of the uh, testing organization is to carry out their duties and contractual obligations in good faith. Um, uh, and, and they also talk about, um, you know, taking action against copyright infringement and, and advice on how to actually go about doing that uh, in the unfortunate situation, uh, in, in case someone's in that unfortunate situation. Uh, they really emphasize that you have to be prepared for a possible lawsuit before the incident. If you wait until after the incident, it's, it's too late uh, and it's very, very unlikely that you're actually going to be able to, uh, to take action. Uh, so with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to John. Thank you, Jim. It's been a great pleasure working with Jim. It's felt a little bit like being back working on a dissertation, you know, intensive study of issues and reading stuff and talking back and forth with a very good uh, professional colleague. My first uh, piece is three sections that will complete uh, part two, security planning, investigations, and communications. On security planning, the uh, key points that are made uh, in some detail are you need to have a comprehensive and written security plan. You may think you're paying adequate attention to security in your program, but if you don't have that, you're probably not. You're probably things that are simply missing, but you haven't taken the trouble to look over all of the things that you do, write it down, get it reviewed, and then evaluate where you stand. Next step after you do that, and for many people, they don't have that. Most programs that I go in to do audits don't have such a thing when we start. But if I go back to do a follow-up audit, they always have one, which is fun. Then you need to develop training materials for everyone involved in development, administration, scoring, protecting of records, so they all know what they're supposed to do. And then keep that material, put it in use, train everyone, and keep it current. And whatever you come up with in guidelines, and this comes up at other places in our book too, follow those guidelines. 
you are dead in the water if you develop guidelines about how we handle security and you don't follow them. You are not going to win in any uh, court, including the court of public opinion. Next slide. John, we've oh, got right. uh, the poll. you spend Excuse so me. much time. John, you spent so much time evangelizing on the importance of security planning and security training. We thought we'd ask the group, what, um, what, what's the situation within your organization? So we'll take just a few seconds here. Uh, let people respond. <clears throat> So I can see that people are feverishly clicking one of the radio buttons on the survey. Just hold it open a couple seconds more. We've got about 80% voted, and here, John, are the results. 36 have pretty formal training, 37% have some, 27% don't have any. Hide that. Thank you. There's a lot of room there for improvement, even though it's good to see there are folks who are paying attention to training. It's a, it's a critical issue. So the next slide. Next chapter is about investigations. And if you're not conducting investigations, it probably means you're not looking carefully enough to see what cheating you have, because you do have cheating, absolutely guaranteed if you have a serious program with stakes associated with it. Uh, that chapter uh, pays quite a bit of attention to the agreement that exists when there is an adult test taker. It doesn't apply so much to testing students in school, but any situation where there's an adult test taker, what is it that you ask them to agree to do before they are permitted to take your test? It deserves a lot of attention because subsequent investigations or if it goes to adjudication are going to look at that. What is it that you expected them to do and what did they agree to do? Uh, thinking about uh, how you deal with information that comes in, either reports or data, uh, what are the triggers that you're going to use to get an investigation going? Particularly if you've not been doing much of it, you could end up being overwhelmed if you don't think through what are we going to really investigate and at what level. Then when you have your results, uh, the, the chapter emphasizes making them understandable. Uh, a lot of the things we do in testing around uh, development, administration, scoring, statistical methods, they're not uh, easy to understand by folks who don't know our discipline, profession, and field. You really need to work at uh, coming up with something that the every, average, everyday person will understand. That's doable, but it's not easy. And then this chapter makes the point I was making earlier. You have rules, follow them. You'd be better off not to have rules. It wouldn't be good, but you'd be better off than to have rules and then have it be revealed that you didn't follow those rules. You've already lost the battle if that's what's happening in your program. Uh, next slide. This deals with the issue of communications related to security. You need a thoughtful plan. Well, who are all the people that need to know about security issues, particularly if there's a problem? How will you arrange that everybody be briefed and up to date so they're not at the last minute trying to learn how we deal with that in our program? They already know. Make sure the people who are going to make decisions have been identified, briefed, and they know what they're supposed to say or who they're supposed to refer questions to. Um, reporters, I have a lot of experience the last few years with reporters. They're going to keep asking you. They're going to keep asking you the question different ways. And you better make sure you're clear on what decision power you have and what you can reveal. And it's all right to say there's someone else that handles that within our organization. It's not all right to say no comment or any answer like that. And you need to uh, communicate with and have ready both the operational folks and the policy people that might get involved with boards or other groups, outside groups that you report to. And then as you get more active in this line of uh, investigations, I don't wish it on you, but it, it, it's out there, you're going to need to think about how you're going to document and communicate about what threats you faced and how did you resolve them. You want to have your story of what happened down and not some, have someone make up a story for you that 
may not say anything at all uh, like what you believe. Let's move on then to the next part. Any questions on what we've covered so far? Steve? Sir, yeah, sorry, John. I was on mute. I think we're uh, okay to keep proceeding. Keep going? Keep going. And there are four areas that we mentioned, uh, case studies corresponding to divisions of ATP. Uh, the first is certification licensure. And I think it's kind of fun that they argue that you should have a healthy level of paranoia. <laughs> if your instincts are people are cheating, you're right. And keep being aware of that. And when you do find that they are, which you will find if you look, make sure you follow up. One of the worst things that you can do is identify a problem and then everybody looks at everyone else. They don't know what to do, so they don't follow up. I mean, you're much worse off, again, there than if you didn't look. Make sure everyone is trained about what it is that they're going to be working with in administration, in securing materials, in dealing with events at centers or reports from centers, including how you deal with unusual events. Okay, this is what you're supposed to do. What do you do if something happens? that isn't uh, the way it should happen. How do you deal with that? Uh, you don't want people deciding on their own, for example, whether to stop testing. And that's a really big event. And you want to make sure you've thought through how you deal with something that might make them wonder if they should do that. You should register copyrights for your tests. If you already do it, that's you know preaching to the choir. But if you don't, find out how to do it. You don't have to disclose and give up your exams. As the Copyright Office has a procedure, and if you do that, then you can recover damages in the lawsuit setting. <laughs> People will be more willing to settle, given that they know that that could happen. And don't think you have to rely only on your internal resources. Go outside if you need more help. Next slide. This slide uh, deals with the clinical domain. And even though I spent a period at uh, the Psychological Corporation where clinical testing was part of the responsibility of mine, Wexler scales and other really important tests. I don't think I was aware, as I should have been, of how much danger there is of getting fraudulent data. Uh, almost all clinical products depend on collecting reference group information so you can compare the data you have with the group. But what if that data is wrong? Uh, the uh, chapter uh, urges developing industry standards of how we will try to prevent that from happening and what kind of warning signals we will look for. But maybe we have a problem. We need to do something different other than just put this data in the form of tables and put it in our manual. Next slide. Next chapter deals with educational testing, and it uses the Atlanta Public Schools uh, situation to make the story it really rings true for me. I spent a lot of time in Atlanta helping to demonstrate how bad their problem was. But part of what was fascinating to me is that I had the experience I was hiking up in the White Mountains with a couple of my kids, which I like to do. We're sitting at a common dinner table. No one knows what I do for a living. I haven't said one word, word, word about testing. And there are three guys sitting next to me, and they start talking about the Atlanta public schools cheating scheme. And it literally was everywhere. Why is it everywhere? Because the pressures to cheat are increasing. I see evidence of that, uh, I don't know about by the week, but certainly every two or three weeks I see some other pressure. The last thing I read, which is quite recent, was uh, an effort to include student scores in the evaluation of principals. It's all over the place in the evaluation of teachers, but I hadn't heard about it in the evaluation of principals. One of the points that is made in this chapter is make it very clear to everyone what's ethical, what's unethical. Don't have any ambiguity about what you're allowed to do. Because testing is different from the rest of instruction and curriculum. It requires different rules, and everybody needs to know what they are. If you do analyses, and you should, use multiple methods. Just because you keep reading about erasure analyses, and it's a perfectly respectable method, it is not the only method or even the best method. So you should use multiple methods and bring things together from the different methods. And if you have multiple flags from different methods, you can be much more persuasive. We really have a problem here. 
This is not chance. This is not some random occurrence. This is trouble. And if you find something, you need to act on it, which is one of the problems in uh, Atlanta Public Schools. They just didn't want to believe they had that level of problem. They were more inclined to think that the newspaper had it in for them, which might have been true, but the newspaper was right. There was a problem. And make sure that, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, that everybody knows who's, the who's supposed to speak with a program and what is appropriate to disclose. Don't be deciding on the spot what you're going to tell outsiders. It doesn't work. Uh, next slide. In the industrial organizational area, we have uh, very good treatment by folks who know that area extremely well, which is true of the other chapters, too. Uh, they make the point that there's quite an accumulating body of knowledge of using tests for um, initial selection, final selection for promotion, and so on. And if you're working in that area and you're not aware of what people are doing to promote security, become aware of it, read about it, learn. And one of the points they make is that there are things you can do with multiple testing events, not just one-time testing, and different ways of analyzing scores to help you identify whether you have a problem in there that needs further attention. And they also make a point which the, the authors make in a number of other occasions also, that there is real benefit to be derived from uh, having test takers uh, commit to using only their own work. Even though you'd say, well, we're dealing with adults, why would an honesty contract work? I'm not sure why, but it does. You ask people to, to be honest, only uh, use their own work, and they do that. They get a definite gain just from doing that. So I think we're ready to move on. So let's go to the next slide. There is a, a, a we have a, a section, a chapter that comments on all of the uh, case studies and tries to make, does make nice observations about how they relate one to another and calling out some themes. But just in the interest of time, we're not going to go over that in detail. Next slide. Next slide, please, Skylar. All right. Well, I think this is, uh, I think I'm back up again here. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, that was terrific. Um, so th this is a big book. Uh, there's an awful lot of information uh, in it. And I think, obviously, John and I would like for you to, you know, purchase it and read it cover to cover. But, uh, but you know, I also realize that 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 may not be realistic. So uh, we thought that we would give you a little bit of uh, advice, at least our advice, our recommendation on, on how maybe you can use this uh, optimally as a resource. The, the first thing that I'd recommend is that uh, even before you sit down and, and read this book, think about what your vulnerabilities are. You know, develop a, a context for reading the book um, so that you, you can approach the book knowing a little bit some of the things that you're interested in, in looking for. Uh, once you have that initial list, just skim the chapters, uh, especially the chapters that relate to your program. Um, but you know, keeping in mind that that the chapters in in part two and and really part three as well uh, cut across pretty much all programs. Where where you anticipate that there's a lot of information in those chapters that's going to relate to everybody, and I think there's probably a good deal of information in those introductory chapters that will relate to you, even if you you know maybe aren't doing paper and pencil testing for example uh, as you're skimming the chapters uh, you know earmark the sections or, or maybe an entire chapter um, that relate to um, you know to your vulnerabilities uh, and, and you know say you know these are ones that uh, I'd like to go back and, and read maybe I want to bring some of my colleagues in as well and suggest that they read this uh, together um, and uh, Cross-referencing, I mean, as you're going through and skimming, I think it might be valuable for you to cross-reference uh, those different sections with your list of vulnerabilities so that you then know as you start to work on a particular vulnerability uh, where that, uh, you know, where that's addressed in the handbook. The handbook does have an index uh, and so will help you in that regard, but, um, you know, I'm sure it, it's not going to do as well as, as you would be able to do by going through and actually looking at what's covered. Uh, 
as you go through, update this list of vulnerabilities. There will surely be things that that um, you don't have on that initial list, but as you go, you know do the skimming, you realize, oh yeah, that's really a problem too. This may wind up being a, a fairly significant list uh, at the end, but you know when you're when you're done and you have this this nice cross-referenced list, uh, I recommend you develop a plan for addressing these vulnerabilities. There's simply no way you're going to be able to do all of them at once. Uh, it takes a lot of time to to do um, uh, to, to make your tests secure, uh, but identify you know what are what are your biggest vulnerabilities or what are uh, the the things that you want where do you want to devote your energies uh, at least initially, um, then you know go back reread those sections that you've identified that relate uh, most specifically to those vulnerabilities, and and, and then follow the advice I and mean, begin to implement. Um, you know what is uh, the good stuff that's discussed in this handbook. Uh, if we go to the the next slide, uh, you know I know that the slides we showed before indicated the the chapter authors, but here again, and you know in their entirety, you can see who are the contributing authors, and these really are the people who are uh, the leaders in the field. I mean, not just leaders generally in test security, but I mean we sought out the people who are. You know, experts in the specific top, topic on which they wrote their chapter, and uh, um, you know, I know John and I have been working in this field for a very long time. Uh, I learned a tremendous amount from uh, from the expertise and the insights of, of these guys, and I, I'm sure that you would as well. Uh, next slide, please. The the last thing we want to leave you with is uh, our top ten takeaways. Uh, what do we think are the, the biggest, most important messages that come out of this handbook? Uh, the first of those is don't become desensitized to cheating. Uh, you need to know that it's a reality. It's happening. You have to stay vigilant um, and look for cheating and, and actively safeguard against it. Um, the, the second one uh, is know your vulnerabilities. Uh, I think I said before that the people who are looking to compromise your program will know your vulnerabilities. Uh, and so you need to recognize those vulnerabilities uh, and use uh, the, the many tools that are available out there uh, you know, to your advantage. There are a lot of tools that can help you identify security breaches. Uh, there are tools that can help you reduce the likelihood of, of those breaches, mitigate damage, um, and, and uh, you, know, you should be uh, incorporating many of those into your program. Uh, the fourth one is, is that the most serious threats tend to uh, happen before or after the test. Uh, I think there's so much focus on what's happening when you've got the examinees in the room. And, and to be sure, there are security risks there You know, during the exam. You've got proxy testing, and you can be capturing and transmitting you know, items during the test. So I mean, that, there, there are some real issues there. But most of the major threats uh, happen before or after um, with respect to um, you know, item sharing and uh, harvesting, uh, hacking databases, uh, illegal coaching, those sorts of things. Uh, so really attend to all phases of, of testing. Uh, the fifth one is that legal standards exist for score cancellation policies and the admissibility of statistical evidence. Uh, so if you're going to be doing, uh, you know, following these guidelines and, and implementing data forensics programs and, and you know, investigating cheating, then you might as well be compliant with uh, with the legal standards because, as John said, if you're not, then it's sort of over before it begins. Uh, next slide, please. Number six is that security planning is critically uh, important. You you have to be ready. You can't wait to respond, but you need to have uh, steps already be in place. Uh, number seven is that you know technology is both a friend and enemy. Uh, we we think about all of the ways in which technology uh, presents challenges from a security perspective, uh, but it's also the case that security is, uh, that, that technology is very helpful. Uh, right, biometric procedures. Uh, technology gives us the opportunity to vary item types and and you know types of administration. Uh, we can video and audio tape uh, testing events. Uh, we can begin to automate, uh, you know, some of the data forensics and and channel people differently, perhaps depending on on patterns that we're observing. So technology 
uh, presents some challenges, but we should be, uh, you know, aware that it also offers some advantages and we should try to take advantage of those. Uh, the uh, eighth one is that we can learn important lessons from the test compromise experiences of our colleagues. Uh, it's unfortunate that people have to go through this, but when they do, uh, we might as well learn from them because otherwise we're doomed to, uh, to go there as well. Uh, number nine is that it takes a village to protect the integrity of our tests. And, and what I mean by that uh, is that there are so many people who are involved in maintaining a program's integrity. If you just think about the number of people uh, and the types of roles that those people have who, uh, you know, who touch the testing process. We have you know, item writers and item review panel members, uh, test administrators and proctors, data managers, computer programmers. Uh, there are the folks who do the scanning, the scanning technicians, um, people involved in printing, shipping, receiving, uh, custodians. Uh, so there are many people who potentially have access to different parts of uh, the testing program. Uh, let's not forget about examinees, test prep companies. It, it's really, it requires uh, everyone's cooperation uh, and, and a culture of test security uh, in order to really pull this off. Uh, you know, it's not that one person can be looking for it. It's everyone's responsibility. Uh, to maintain the integrity of our tests. Uh, and then the final point is that test fraud dynamic. Uh, it is uh, constantly changing. Uh, unfortunately, test fraud is a very profitable, bit, profitable business. So whatever uh, security measures we put in place, there are going to be people who are actively looking for ways to undermine them. Uh, so, you know, we, we can't wait to uh, react after it's already been compromised. We, we've got to think of this more as a game of chess and, you know, be actively looking for new vulnerabilities and anticipating uh, those uh, new ones and defending against whatever we think is going to be the next move of our opponent. Um, so I think, that, I think that's all that we have for you. Uh, Steve, I think you maybe have another poll here coming up. You know, in the essence of time, there are some questions that I want you guys to be able to address. Let's keep moving. Oh, great. Um, and uh, let's just move to the next slide, Skylar, please. So clearly the handbook is an important, powerful new resource. There are some other things we want to make the attendees aware of that also might prove useful. They're listed here. But I've had a number of people ask, where can they buy this handbook? Uh, so let's go to the next slide, please. So let's leave this slide up. It indicates where you can find the handbook and pre-purchase it. Also, there's a code here that will allow you to realize a 20% discount. Uh, and, and let's leave that slide there. Jim, one of the questions is, does the book, does the handbook include templates and or sample policies and other sample procedures? Does it give those kinds of tools within it? It, it? Uh, it does in some cases, yeah. So it, it gives uh, examples of, um, uh, you know, agreement forms, you know, with the test taker agreements and sample uh, test plan and, and that sort of thing. Not so much uh, in the form of like templates or anything, but uh, just sort of within the context of the chapter, the, the, the authors will give, um, you know, examples of what that language might look like and what are the elements. So, um, you know, I, I think the, the short answer is yes. Okay. Terrific. Um, one of the questions was, do any of the sections regarding cheating prevention discuss ways to decrease the pressure to cheat? They do certainly the the chat you know in the front of the book in part one um, I think there's a lot of focus on um, you know in the classroom testing chapter there are ways that you can re reduce reduce the pressure or just make students less uh, less interested in cheating this the idea that uh, the um, you know, the, the professor, you know, really values their own work, those sorts of things. Within the standardized context, the standardized testing context, uh, I think 
probably less so because I don't, uh, you know, without re lowering stakes, it's just a little bit harder. Um, but I, I think it, I think it is there. It's not there, um, you know, in a in a real pronounced way. Uh, but it is there in in some of the chapters. Great. It comes up Thanks. a great deal in educational uh, settings, uh, K-12 testing. If you mm -hmm. are a superintendent or a principal or anybody who's an administrator and you keep beating on teachers saying that you want test scores to be going up and you're not talking to them about you want student learning to increase, and you want to provide resources and training and, and help so that that's where the discussion goes, uh, you're looking for trouble. I mean, you just keep coming back and say we want higher scores, and you're not providing more help, more time, you know, uh, things like that that could really make a difference. What do you expect to happen? Mm. Yeah, thanks, John. That that's a good point. I wasn't even thinking as I answered about sort of the educators' side of of things. Uh, but right, yeah, I know certainly the the chapter, your chapter, and also the Kingston chapter, uh, the case studies education chapter, that certainly emphasizes. Um, how to talk with educators uh, in a way that um, that makes it less likely for them to engage in in some of these activities. So, so guys, we are bumping up on the end of the hour. We do try to keep these uh, to 60 minutes or less. There are some other questions, so I think we should thank people for attending. And if you want to stay on the line. Uh, we're going to address a couple of the other questions that were raised. And please know that we will send an email with links to accessing the slides and the recorded presentation. So I know that many of you may have to ring off now that we're uh, at the new hour. Um, for those that can stay, here's, here's a question that I know one person asked it, John, but I know it's rattling through other people's heads too. And, and we talk so much about all the things a program can do to better protect its items, but how can you do it all with a limited budget? Any response or any, any guidance you can lend, John and Jim? Yes, maybe we both want to respond to that. You could say that about any aspect of uh, a program. I mean, how can we be sure that we have items of the level of quality and currency and you know, relevance to the decision we're going to make. I think it's a question of setting priorities. And uh, one of the easiest things to do, it's not, it won't encourage everything, but it does make a difference, is making sure that everybody knows the rules. Everybody knows what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. And all of those who are in positions to communicate that Communicate it. Uh, uh, I don't want to go on too long here, but if, if you really believe in a school district, which basically schools don't have that high a level of cheating, but if you really believe that you want it to be as low as possible, zero tolerance, then have the principals and the assistant superintendents go to the training where school test coordinators get trained and be seen sitting there studying, asking questions. That's a way that shows that they really do care about it. It's not just lip service. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, and I guess I would say um, that, that, I mean, obviously budget is a, you know, is a reality. Uh, many of the things uh, aren't, uh, many of the things that are presented in this handbook aren't really cost prohibitive. I mean, there isn't a huge cost associated with um, registering a copyright or with uh, developing a, a uh, you know, really good um, candidate agreement form. And there are a lot of things uh, that that aren't uh, cost prohibitive. Um, there are some others, obviously, that are that are you know that are more costly. Uh, I, I guess I would just caution people. I mean, as they set their priorities, to uh, to try to weigh the costs associated with um, you know prevention and detection with the cost of a breach. Uh, because my understanding is that uh, the, the organizations who have dealt with breaches and the legal issues and, and the costs in lost test items, uh, you know, that usually, um, you know, outweighs the, the cost of, 
uh, test security by quite a, a large amount. So I was just made aware, Jim, that the link on this page, the short link, is broken. So we will um, send out the full link in our follow-up email to all registrants and attendees so that you will have the appropriate uh, link to acquire this. Um, you, can always just, let's, you can Google Handbook of Test Security, too, and, and okay. it should come up. And let's see, some, um, well, we're now four minutes after the hour, but thank you both for the, sharing your thoughts on the uh, prioritization with tight budgets. Um, here's a question. Does, does the book explore some of the issues around student authentication in distance ed assessment, distance education? And, and even K-12 student assessments, how, how does it address right. so so that, identification? Yeah, that information is, is uh, part of the technology, uh, you know, in, in te the technology-based testing uh, chapter. Um, you know, I suspect that five years from now, were that chapter to be rewritten, you know, would probably have a much heavier emphasis on on that because of all that we'll be learning. Uh, but uh, but yes, most definitely that is covered in the technology-based testing chapter. Okay, great. And I've been in, informed that the short link does work. A bunch of people have actually uh, had that link work and have already gone and purchased the Handbook of Test Security. So good stuff there. Um, we're now five minutes after the hour. I think we should uh, be sensitive to people's schedules and time constraints. Uh, if there are questions that we didn't address in the session, we will write responses and make those available. But I want to thank Dr. Jim Wallach very, very much for joining us today. Jim, this, this, this handbook, the, its publication is such a milestone, I think. In, in test security, and uh, so thank you very much for your contributions to our industry and for joining us today. It's wonderful. Thank you very much. And Dr. John Freemer, as always, uh, it's a pleasure, and thank you for lending your experience and knowledge to all of us. Glad to do it. Hey, everybody. Hope you have a great day. Thank you very much for joining us. Next month in the Caveon webinar series, uh, Dr. Dave Foster is going to be evaluating different online proctoring technologies. What works, what doesn't, what's important, how can you maximize security with online proctoring. So maybe that will be interesting for some of you. Stay tuned and we'll see you next month. Thank you all. Yeah.